date is July 14th, on the year 1683, and the Grand Vizier Kara Mustafa Pasha is outside the walls of Vienna, with a massive army which must have looked frightening to the eyes of uh, the besieged Viennese. The strength of the Ottoman army was 150 to 170,000 soldiers. That day, Kara Mustafa sent the traditional demand that the city surrender to the Ottoman Empire. The leader of the Viennese defense refused to capitulate. Kara Mustafa ordered the siege operations to begin on the 17th of July. The Ottomans had about 130 field guns and 19 medium caliber cannons, which was uh, less than the 370 of uh, the defenders in the city. So it would be difficult for them to advance. A stalemate occurred where the Ottomans dug tunnels underneath, try and reach the city walls and blow them up from underground. The siege cut virtually every means of food and supply into Vienna. Fatigue and exhaustion became very common amongst the soldiers. What happened next is the stuff of legend. But to cut a long story short, the Viennese of the so-called Holy Roman Empire of the Habsburgs, with the help from Polish allies, prevailed and defeated the Ottoman Turks in the Battle of Kalmberg Mountain. Mustafa Pasha had to run away for his life. But, well, with the enormous defeat of the Ottomans and the failure of the Ottoman Empire to capture Vienna, the retreating Ottoman army left behind all the booty, all the treasures um, of their camp. Tents, sheep, cattle and camels. The enemy now was ruined and everything lost for them. They just had to run for their lives. Among those treasures in the Turkish camp, it was rumored that there were 500 bags of coffee, abandoned by the enemy. And this is one of uh, the very popular myths of how coffee houses and coffee was introduced to Europe from uh, the Middle East. But did uh, the European lab affair with coffee start in Vienna? Is there any grain of truth on that? Hello! Welcome back to another archaeogastronomical adventure with me, Thomas Dinas. This is the Delicious Legacy Podcast. coffee. A nice cup of coffee. Good morning. I don't know about you, but I love starting my day in the morning with a strong double espresso and then perhaps followed straight away with another longer coffee. Black, of course. No milk or sugar. But yeah, coffee. What a strange concept if you think about it, hey? It wasn't something that um, existed in Europe like 300 years ago. And yet it's very difficult to imagine our culture, our modern European culture at least, without coffee, without this beverage. If I just think about coffee right now, the first thing that comes into my mind is espresso, Italy. Espresso machines. So coffee, yeah, comes with this association into my head. If I think about it a little bit more, maybe, okay, maybe Brazil, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Peru, Colombia, South America in general, But you see, the history of coffee does not start there, in none of these countries. All these are very recent developments in the history of coffee. In my mind also, as a Greek, coffee is inextricably connected and linked with um, the Turks, Turkish. You see, there is 
the most popular way of drinking coffee in Greece is what we call Turkish coffee. Or since um, the mid-70s, it was rebranded as um, Greek coffee in Europe and in Greece, of course. But yeah, up then we used to call it Turkish coffee. So yeah, again, my mind, and I guess with a lot of people, is the same. The association of coffee is Italy, Turkey, perhaps, and South America. So let's explore the history of coffee, a history of amazing myths and legends, religion, conflict, trade, war, and colonialism. Let's try and trace its origins deep in the past and in faraway lands. But first, a quick reminder that uh, you can uh, help the podcast by leaving a comment on Apple Podcasts uh, and rate and review on Spotify and so on and so on. That really helps the podcast to grow and reach more people out there. Also, if you want the episodes early and ad-free, and more importantly, with extra exclusive material, join me on Patreon, where you can support this podcast from £3 per month. And now back to our adventure. As we've seen, in 1683, Vienna was attacked for the second time in the recent history by the Ottoman Turks. The city was liberated after several months of siege, thanks to, according to legend, information provided by Franz Konzinski, a young Polish noble. As a reward, he received 500 bags of coffee, abandoned by the enemy camp. According to the legend, this is how the first Central European cafe opened. Konzinski served the Turkish coffee but the taste was not appreciated by the Viennese. Then, the young man had the brilliant idea to filter his coffee and to sweeten it with milk and honey, and the success was immediate. To accompany the coffee and to hold on to his clients, he created an ensemble of rituals that are still followed today, like playing classical music, making newspapers made available every morning, and serving a glass of water with the coffee on a small tray. What happened in Vienna? What were the Turks doing there? Was the story behind the mythical introduction of coffee in Europe? July 14, 1683. The siege of Vienna officially started. The overwhelming numbers of the Ottoman army and the skill of the sappers, the power of their cannons, made it seem almost inevitable that the city would be sacked in no time. Ten days later, a huge explosion went off and the earthenware section of the wall flew in the air, and the Janissaries, the elite Turkish army unit, rushed into the gap to assault the second line of the main wall. Yet, the Viennese resisted. Three weeks into the attack, finally, the Ottomans made a massive hole in the ravelin. But, again, they didn't succeed getting into the city, because reinforcements arrived from Poland. 3,000 winged hussars, an elite cavalry unit from Poland, moved into an advantageous attacking position against the Ottomans. Together with an additional 15,000 cavalry, they were very well placed to inspect Mustafa's huge but exhausted army for five whole days before their attack. Mustafa did very little to fortify the flanks of his army, And so, the Hussars advanced steadily towards the Turks. What happened next is the Staff of Legend, one of the most famous battles in history. Imagine 20,000 horsemen in total galloping towards the Turks, going downhill. The commotion, the rumble, the clouds of dust and the frightful noise from those winged Hussars. These wings were attached on the horseman's back. It not only looked scary, but as they ran, as they galloped, the air passing through those angel-looking contraptions made a horrifying noise that scared everyone, and especially the enemy infantry. Inevitably, one might say, the Ottomans retreated after losing many men, and the siege was abandoned. When the Polish Habsburg army entered the Turkish camp, found, obviously, a huge amount of uh, valuables left behind because the army retreated in a hurry. They discovered several sacks of dry, dark 
brown beans, among the other booty left behind by the retreating enemy. Unaware of their purpose or value, the Polish king Sobieski gave the sack of useless beans to an officer named, and I'm sorry for my pronunciation here of the name, Jerzy Franciszek Kluziski. Kluziski, whether he shared his information with the king or not, he was well aware of just how valuable these beans were, having learned about coffee during time he spent in Turkish captivity. So he is often credited with uh, adapting coffee to European tastes by adding milk and sugar to the strong, bitter Turkish drink. So that's one of the founding myths of uh, how coffee came to Europe and how coffee houses started their existence in European soil. Of course, this is most likely to be a myth without any foundation in reality, to be honest. But it's a nice story to say on how the first Viennese coffee house opened or how coffee came to Vienna. What we know is, um, at least what we we read online, is that the first Viennese coffee house was opened by Johannes Theodat in 1685. So really early, really soon after the, um, the siege of Vienna. Early coffee houses offered the customers a color chart depicting various shades of brown, lighter or darker, from which the customers choose the particular hue of preference. It was not until much later that individual coffee preparations were christened with the names familiar to customers today. And of course today, we can have all sorts of coffee concoctions. Dark, sweet, milky, spiced, and not just black and bitter, as the first Viennese customers must have tasted it over three centuries ago. The beverage has many subtle notes, especially if trying it black and from different world regions. Drinking it is a sensorial experience. This much is known. Ethiopia is the birthplace of the coffee tree, but the spiritual home of coffee, as a drink that we can recognize today, is Yemen. What happened? Coffee now is a, is a product that is grown all over the world, and we know more Brazilian, Indonesian, Colombian, Kenyan, Guatemalan coffee, but not the Yemeni one. Well, there's more stories about our coffee and many, many myths that we shall see right now. The coffee tree was from Ethiopia. There it grows wild. The cloud forests of Ethiopia are the birthplace of the coffee tree. In a curious coincidence, Ethiopia is the birthplace of mankind too, specifically the Rift Valley. But how did that red ripe fruit was transformed into the drink we all know and love today? Ethiopians were drinking coffee long before the rest of the world and have a ceremony for sharing the brew. First, green beans are roasted at the table. The hostess then passes the still smoking beans around, so each guest can inhale the aroma. A node to the moment is offered, and the beans are ground in a stone mortar and brewed. You must take three cups, abole, berke, sostka, for friendship and prosperity. By the 16th century, kwahwa was available throughout the Islamic world. Debate began about the salubrity, morality and legality of the intoxicating plant. But let's go back now, to that mysterious time before the dawn of civilization, the pre-caffeinated era. Back then, 1500 years ago, the world's first coffee lovers, the nomadic Oromos, lived in the kingdom of Kefa. The Oromos didn't actually drink coffee, they ate it, crushed, mixed with fat, and shaped into a golf ball-sized treats. They were especially fond of munching on those coffee balls before they going to battle against the people of Bonga, who generally beat the pants of the Oromos. The Bongans also happened to be the first slave traders and sent about 7,000 slaves each year to the Arabic markets in Harar. A fair number of these unfortunates were Oromos coffee chewers who had been captured in battle. It was these people who accidentally first brought the bean to Harar. Ethiopian rangers say the old slave trails are still shaded by coffee trees that have been grown from the discarded meals. There are two basic species of coffee beans. The Lassius Arabica from East Africa, which prefers higher elevations, and the reviled Robusta from Zaire, which grows just about anywhere. Beans from the relatively low-lying Kefa grow in huge coffee jungles, 
and are generally more akin to that robustus coffee that we just said. The Harar's beans, however, by contrast, are long-bodied and possess delicious personalities, like the Arabicas. In adapting to Harar's higher altitude, something wonderful seemed to have happened then and to them. These beans that evolved to the Arabica beans of Harar and later brought to Yemen and then to the world at large. But how was that coffee became the drink we know of? There's another mythological uh, story here, the story about Kaldi and his dancing goats, and it goes something like this. An Ethiopian goat herd named Kaldi one day noticed his best goat dancing about and bleeding like a maniac. It seemed to happen after the old billy goat had been nibbling the berries of a certain plant. The goat herd tried a few himself, and soon was dancing about too. A holy man wandered by and asked the boy why he was dancing with a goat. The goat herd explained. The monk took some berries home and found that after eating them, he could not sleep. It so happened that this holy man was famous for his rather tedious all-night sermons and was having trouble keeping his disciples awake. So he immediately ordered all his disciples, called dervishes, to chew the bean before be preached. The dervishes' sleepness vanished and word spread about the great prophet whose electrifying wisdom kept you awake until dawn. Of course, the story is all but a myth. There's no, there's no way that the history of coffee is so simple. I mean, in order to get the drink as it is today, a ripe red fruit needs to dry, strip the seed off the flesh, and then toast the green bean, and then ground it to dust and boil it. Yeah, somehow I think our little goat heard her uh, telling us fibs about um, the discovery of coffee. Yemen is the driest place that coffee grows, across the country and in high quality. Yemenis were the first to harvest coffee and consume the beverage on a wide scale. The legendary Arabica beans are well known throughout the world and have been for many centuries. Yemenis exported their beans to the rest of the world through the port of Mocha. The most reliable evidence of early knowledge of the coffee tree and coffee consumption appear in the mid-15th century in the Sufi monasteries of Yemen in the South Arabian Peninsula. In the 16th century, Yemen began to export coffee to Persia, Egypt, Syria and Turkey and gradually expanded to as many as 70 countries. Mocha coffee beans are considered a luxury. The name Mocha originally comes from Mocha, a famous Yemeni port on the Red Sea coast and an early hub for the coffee trade. Coffee from Mocha is known for its unique taste and high quality that distinguishes it from coffee types grown in other countries. The actual plant, Coffea Arabica, as it's officially known, and it's in wild state, is treated as endangered, existed in Ethiopian highlands for many thousands of years. Coffee, the drink, and all the culture around it, as we've seen earlier, and as we will encounter later on the episode, all the paraphernalia and costumes came from somewhere else. Not Ethiopia, that somewhere is Yemen, that's uh, where the cherry traveled to and got transformed and transformed us to. This story, this from here to there and how it evolved almost out of nothing, is definitely a captivating insight into a conjunction of interconnected possibilities. Several factors seem to have come together at a particular junction in time and space to take this plant from the isolated wild origins and to become one of the most successful commodities in our modern world. In southern Yemen, that coffee was first cultivated 800 years ago on the legendary Nakil Sumara or Coffee Mountain. The Yemenis had convinced Europeans that coffee would grow only there, according to English traveller John Jourdain, writing 1616, because it was the highest mountain in Arabia. By the 1400s, when the Turks conquered Yemen, coffee from Mocha was being drunk throughout the Islamic world. When the first English trader visited the port in 1606, almost half a century before Europe's first cafe opened, he reported that there were over 35 merchant ships from as far away as India crowding the harbour all waiting for the bags of coffee that cluttered the docks. 
the English merchant John Juden wrote that Mocha was full of all kinds of commodities that are so dear that there's no dealing for us at the rates they sell them to the merchants from Great Cairo. Coffee palaces lined the harbour and princes sat on gold cushions fanned by hordes of slaves. There was even a private army whose job was to ensure that no infidel stole one of the precious coffee plants. Pedro Teixeira, who came from a family of Maranos, Jews forced to convert to Christianity during the Spanish Inquisition, between 1586 and 1605. He wrote, visiting Cuba, Mexico, California, the Philippines, Sumatra, Malacca, Goa, and finally the Middle East, where he observed with fascination the growing importance of the coffee house and coffee culture. Among other buildings, there is also a coffee house. In these houses, all meet who want to drink it, noblemen as well as commoners. As they sit together, they are served this drink, very hot, in small porcelain cups. Everyone takes a cup in his hand, blows a little and then sips from it. The drink is black and has little taste. And although some good qualities are attributed to it, none are known for certain. However, it is the custom to meet here and chat, and they derive much enjoyment from it. In order to attract more customers, handsome boys who are richly dressed are chosen to serve the coffee and receive the money, accompanied by music and other entertainments. During summer, these houses are frequented mainly at night, and in winter during the day. The great coffee house is situated near the river, which can be overlooked from windows and galleries and makes it a very pleasant place to relax. There are several such houses in the town and many others in all Turkish lands and in Persia. There are coffee houses very notable for their structure and furnishings and decorated with many lamps as they are the busiest at night, but they are also well attended during the day. The first European to write about coffee was Prosper Alpinus, a famous physician from Padua and a great botanist who accompanied a council from the Republic of Venice to Egypt in 1580. Alpinus lived there for several years and wrote a book about Egyptian medicinal plants in which he discussed coffee. I have seen, at Cairo, a tree in the garden of a Turk named Ali Bey and I have been given the figure of one of its bows. It is the same which produces the fruit so common in Egypt, which they call bon or ban. There is made with it, among the Arabs and Egyptians, a kind of decoction very much in use and which they drink instead of wine. This drink is called quahwa and the fruit comes from Arabia Felix. Arabia Felix was the name the Romans gave to the southern end of the Arabian Peninsula, where dancing waters from silvery streams rushed down pristine mountains into rich fertile valleys below. Again, Arabia is in our radar in one more episode, and especially the southern part in Yemen, and all these fantastic sounding places were real. It was a magical place. I mean, there is a rumor that even Alexander the Great had a dream to conquer Arabia and retire there in what is now Yemen. That land to Europeans was as uh, distant as uh, the moon to us now. Hardly anyone traveled there. And of course, when they did, it was with wonder and awe. And uh, that was coming out on how they described it. One of these uh, daring explorers who wandered into Yemen was an Englishman called George Sandys, who just went there simply out of curiosity. He departed Venice in 1610 and he voyaged uh, through Turkish dominions for several years, like uh, Odysseus, and several times fleeing from pirates and finding himself caught up in strange caravans. Today's episode is brought to you with the welcome support of Malbin Greek, UK's leading Greek delicatessen, supplier and distributor of premium Greek produce. Whatever you need, Malbin Greek has you covered. You can shop online and have the divine and delicious goods delivered to your doorstep across the UK, or you can visit the shop at Art17 Apollo Business Park, Lucy Way, SC16, 4ET, Bermondsey, London. Malbin Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix.
Hello, hello. This is Dr. Rad. And this is Dr. G. And together, we're the co hosts of The Partial Historians. We love ancient Rome and all the quirks that humanity has to offer. Our podcast combines analysis, discussion about sources, and a good dash of irreverence. As lovers of the delicious legacy, we know you have an appetite for the delights of the ancient world. Join us for our narrative episodes as we explore the history of Rome from the founding of the city. Or perhaps you'd like to drop by for our special episodes on topics such as historical films, ancient personalities, academic guests, and our never-ending fight about who was the better emperor, Augustus or Tiberius. It's Tiberius. It's definitely Augustus. <laughs> You can find The Partial Historians wherever you listen to quality podcasts, such as The Delicious Legacy. We're out and about on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And now, back to your regular program. Sandis, unlike the merchants he travelled with, was a keen observer of daily life. Writing of Turkish drinking habits, he said, Although they be destitute of taverns, they have their coffer houses, which something resemble them. They sit there, chatting most of the day, and sip a drink called coffer, in little china dishes, as hot as they can suffer it, black as soot, and tasting not much unlike it. And as an afterthought, he added, Many of the coffermen keep beautiful boys who serve to procure them customers. It wasn't until many years later that a European travel writer reached Yemen itself. On the first day of our journey, he wrote, we rested in a coffee house situated near a village. Mokia is the name given by Arabs to such places, which stand in the open country and are intended like our inns, for the accommodation of travellers. They are mere huts and are scarcely furnished with a serir or long seat of straw ropes. Nor do they afford any refreshment but kisher, a hot infusion of coffee beans. This drink is served out of coarse earthen cups, but persons of distinction always carry porcelain cups in their baggage. The master of the coffee house lives commonly in some neighborhood village, whence he comes every day to wait for passengers. This was a far cry from the opulent rooms, bedecked in silks and velvet, that came to be the pride of cities like Baghdad, Damascus or Istanbul. On the other hand, the village in which uh, our European traveller found himself was only a short distance from the hills in which coffee was grown, and but a few days' journey from the harbour of Mocha, where this commodity was exported. By that time, coffee was already well known in Europe, and coffee houses had been a part of Yemeni life for hundreds of years. Still, he was one of the first Europeans to describe it, an indication of how distant and strange Yemen was even in the mid-18th century. So it's hardly surprising that historians like uh, La Roque and uh, naturalists like Alpinus could find little to say about the origins of coffee. So when Prosper Alpinus went to Egypt. Coffee had been in use there for more than half a century. In 1510, there was not a single coffee house in Cairo, but just 20 years later, there were multitudes, as witnessed uh, by a Turkish writer who stayed there for a while and noted the concentration of coffee houses at every step. Early rising worshippers and pious men get up and go there, drink a cup of coffee, adding life to their life. They feel, in a way, the slight acceleration strengthens them for their religious observance and worship. Cairo, however, produced no coffee and Alpinus could trace this being no further than his vague reference to Arabia Felix. But Philippe Sylvestre Tifu wrote a small book published in 1685 where he thought he could fix the origin of uh, coffee in Persia. The first that makes mention of the property of this bean under the name of Bunkum in the 9th century was Zachary Mohamed Rasez, commonly called Rashio, a very famous Arab physician. Tifur wrote, He then set forth 
the thesis that coffee in fact came from Persia and had been known in that part of the world for nearly a millennium. Of course, Dufour was wrong and his uh, disastrous error led the writers astray for, <laughs> for generations. And of course, within this um, error, we also see again this cultural and linguistic confusion that surrounds coffee and how the myths regarding coffee are always uh, reproduced and taken as uh, facts and thus history. And of course, a lot of this information goes unchallenged and passes from generation to generation and it comes as um, authoritative uh, and factual information. Of course, we can see how easy it is for Europeans to make mistakes and confuse uh, terms and references in the Arabic language. So in Arabic, the word el means foreign, and depending uh, on where it is spoken, the word can refer to different lands. In the northern parts of the Arabian Peninsula, it can mean Persia, of course, which is nearer and closer to this part. But in the south, where uh, our uh, esteemed writer was in uh, Yemen, the term is used in reference to the people of the opposite coast, specifically Sudan and Ethiopia. And in similar fashion, the Arabic word Kwahwa, which means which came to mean coffee, and ban and bunkum, which now is used as a term for the coffee bean, had a multitude of references depending on where or when it was written or spoken. So kawa is a general term which uh, in ancient times meant wine, but changed in meaning as the dictates about the uh, Islamic religion uh, led to prohibition of alcoholic drinks. So it came to mean a brew or an infusion without a substance being specified. It could mean coffee, of course, but equally it could mean an infusion from a plant called cat, which was used in the south in Yemen long before coffee was known. Paris, summer of 1714. It's a breezy Sunday afternoon. Jean de la Roque hurried down, bound for the Jardin de Plantes. He'd been invited there by the head gardener to witness something that few Europeans had ever seen. Something indeed so special that his hands trembled with anticipation and his heart pounded as he strolled quickly along the quay. What was it that induced such a response to the Parisian gentleman? Back then, two and a half centuries ago, what Jean de la Roque was going to witness was something extraordinary. Only in one other place in Europe, at the famed Hortus Medicus in Amsterdam, had anyone accomplished such a feat, coaxing a coffee tree to bear fruit in European soil. For Jean de la Roque, seeing this horticultural sleight of hand was a culmination of an obsession which had plagued him since childhood. He had long been fascinated by the stories of his father, who had travelled to Constantinople in 1644 and then to the Levant, bringing back to his home in Marseille not only some of the first coffee ever seen there, but also the enticingly exotic service used in Turkey when entertaining guests. The tiny cups of ancient China, the little silk napkins embroidered in gold, the delicate silver spoons and the lacquered serving tray. Coffee was a little more than a curiosity when Roque's father had returned to France, and it was brewed sparingly in drawing rooms of the wealthy, or those who had, through travel or trade, contracted the habits of the Levant. But in 1669, something happened in which made this substance very much in vogue and launched the epoch of coffee that so fascinated La Roque. In July that year, the emissaries of Sultan Mohammed IV came to Paris, bringing with them sacks upon sacks of a curious bean. When the Sultan's ambassador left in May, the following year, the coffee habit he introduced into Parisian society had already become the newest fad. People of means were beginning to bring it in from Marseille, or making private arrangements with ship's captains who sailed to the Levant. Yet it wasn't until 1672 that an enterprising Armenian, known simply as Pascal, took to selling it publicly, first at the Grand Fair of Saint-Germain, and then in a little shop located at the Quai de Levol, where he sold coffee for two souls, six deniers, or about two English pennies, a dish. Laroque was uh, writing about a little lame man who, through the streets of Paris, tooting his strange new drink. He had a napkin tied about him, very neat, 
carrying in one hand a chafing dish made for the purpose, upon he would set his coffee pot. In the other hand, he carried a kind of fountain full of water, and before him a tin basket where he kept all his utensils. Within a brief period, coffee had gone from an exotic luxury to a necessary commodity, with shiploads of raw beans in rough, muslin sacks coming into the harbour almost every day. Coffee had come of age. What had been small-scale bartering 40 years before had emerged into a full-fledged commerce. And the Ottomans, who until now controlled the trade through the Red Sea ports, were quick to realise a good thing when they saw one, as they have been searching for an alternative to the spice monopoly that the Dutch had lifted from them. So what were the stories which the Arab world passed on to explain the origin of coffee? These were variations of epic tales which appealed more to the imagination than to the intellect. But they all seemed to run along a common line. A Sufi Sikh saves his followers from a deadly plague or famine by feeding them coffee berries, which an apparition leads him to discover in the foothills near the Yemeni sea coast. Of course, the interesting part of the story is that uh, they assume the coffee grew wild in the vicinity of uh, the port of Mocha in Yemen, as we've seen. Which could be true by the time these stories start taking place from the mid-13th century onwards, but of course we don't know. What we can also imply is that prior to this time the drink was unknown, at least in Arabia. Lastly, they link the origin of coffee consumption to the Sufi order within Islam, a fact which is substantiated by other historical documentation. But if coffee wasn't sent to the Arabs by messenger of God, the question still remained, where did they get it from? For us, it's not difficult to understand now how the coffee plant could have made the short jump across the Red Sea from Ethiopia to Yemen. But that doesn't really explain the mystery of why coffee became a drink, or how, in a few short years, arose from obscurity to become a commodity of enormous importance. So. Let's um, clear the misty clouds of the highlands in Ethiopia and see a little bit of the background of the picture. At the end of the 15th century, the Arab world was undergoing a major retreat from its point of expansion. The Christian reconquest of Spain was nearly complete, and in the east, the Egyptian caliphate, having become hopelessly corrupt, was under threat by the Ottoman Turks. Even worse, the Portuguese who have found the new sea routes to India, now were able to bypass the Red Sea ports, and thus squeezing the Islamic merchants out of the lucrative pepper trade. And the great caravans, loaded down with spices from the east, faded silently into the rippling desert heat, now little more than a mirage. For many writers, Arab writers, this time was seen as a period of decline and despair, summed up in the words of a contemporary poet, For that I live in an age becoming exceedingly strange, cruel and terrible, wherein we need most urgently a statement of our faith. A deep sense of malaise prevailed in the land of the crescent moon, and there were those who began searching for something to fill the spiritual and economic void, the great chasm in the heart of Islam. It was within this context that Sufism, a mystic order that sought to look beyond the material world, took root amongst the masses who were beginning to see themselves marching down the long, dusty road to oblivion. In the final decades of the 15th century, the Sufi ranks swelled as thousands of artisans, laborers and students dug their way from the debris of the collapsing social edifice to follow the local saint, hoping to find illumination to brighten up the shadows of their bleak existence. Like many leaders of mass religious movements, which are suddenly besieged with such desperate converts, naturally, more than a few Sufi Sikhs were quick to see the advantage in having gained so loyal and obedient flock. Naturally, it wasn't long before Sufism became a prime target of attack from established secular and religious leaders who saw this pesky but rather docile sect become, in their eyes at least, a full-fledged political threat. However, Sufism was neither a strictly hierarchical order nor was it monastic. In fact, its adherent was encouraged to seek his own path of enlightenment. 
The Sufi, who set forth to find God, called himself a traveler, and he advanced by slow stages towards the goal of union with the great universe of the spirit. Something like the quest of the gurus in the 60s, I suppose. Like then, the dissatisfaction with the trappings of secular wealth and the perceived hypocrisy of the established order led to massive experimentation with devices which might transport those many unhappy souls to another realm, where the burdens of everyday life could be left behind and the spirit might soar. Of course, for a devout Muslim, the Quran was quite specific about which substances could or could not be taken into the body to help the spirit, of course, gain flight. Wine or any similar beverage was definitely out. So the ingredient that other cultures and religions have found the quickest way to numb senses and go to a state that there's no suffering or desire or sense of self, namely alcohol, was denied to the Sufis and Islam and Muslims in general. On the other hand, Sufism was not the individual quiet contemplation of a monk, of a Christian monk, let's say. It was a very social thing and far from quiet. If the way to God was through denial of self, it was better to do it with such fervor that each spirit would leap out of the body and come together in oneness of the divine. Thus, a typical Sufi gathering was characterized by a frenzy of activity, which gave rise to the whirlwind images related by astounded European explorers after witnessing the dancing dervishes of the Sufi sects whose chanting gyrations would easily go on throughout the night. Parties like that don't go very far without stimulus. So the need for an amphetamine-like substance existed. And in the same general location, there was a plant which provided such drug. The only thing necessary was to put the two together. Having been established in the Sufi community of Yemen, the coffee trail quite naturally followed the trade routes, traveled by steady stream of merchants, buyers and sellers, many of whom were Sufis, already addicted to the caffeinated prowess the roast had been provided. By the last decade of the 15th century, there were dedicated coffee shops along those well-trod paths. The spread of coffee along the ancient arteries of the Levant, stretching from Mecca to Aleppo and then on Baghdad and Mosul to the east and Alexandria Cairo to the west, was quick indeed. Initially connected to the Sufi Dakars that had taken up the ritual use of coffee as practiced in Yemen, it wasn't long until a nascent coffee culture began to take roots in cities and towns throughout the Middle East. It was in Cairo, at the early, very early stages of the 16th century, where we have one of the first detailed descriptions of how this new coffee culture was developing. A Sufi theological complex located at the Yemeni district of the city served it up at the religious gatherings. The Arab historian Ibn Abd al Ghaffar gives us an indication of the ritual use of coffee in these Sufi ceremonials. They drank it every Monday and Friday evening, putting it in a large vessel made of red clay. Their leader ladled it out with a small dipper and gave it to them to drink, passing it to the right while they recited their blessings. It wasn't long before coffee started to appear on the streets, as word got out around its potency, and it quickly emerged as a drink in its own right, not only as a promised pathway to God. It may have tasted bitter, but ordinary people in Cairo loved it. Coffee made them feel good, bright and alert. It cleared the heads. They drank it hot from small porcelain cups, as hot as they could stand it. But before coffee drinking could become universally approved, in the Muslim world at least, something else had to be considered. Was it legal beyond religious ritual? In some communities it was. In others, a legal judgment from the leading mullahs would be issued, and coffee as a popular drink would be forbidden, at least for a while. As it happened, unsurprisingly, the test came in the town that gave birth to the religion of Muhammad. In 1511, the governor of Mecca was leaving the mosque one evening after prayers and was offended by the boisterous group loitering outside, who were drinking some unknown substance. He first thought they were imbibing wine, which was strictly forbidden. As it turned out, they were only drinking coffee. But since this group, who were balancing small white cups in their hands, seemed talkative, loud and exuberant, the governor concluded that the drink in those little porcelain cups must lead men to wantonness. As a faithful guardian of public morality, he was determined to suppress it. A council of religious scholars was duly convened, and after discussing the disturbance that was witnessed that evening, it was decided such gatherings should be forbidden, a 
along with the substance that deemed to have caused this unseemly behavior, our beloved coffee. As long as it remained a ceremonial beverage, there was no problem. It was only when coffee became a popular drink beyond the reach of the mosque that it looked uh, upon by those in power as a suspect commodity. Of course, the real fear, we might uh, assume, we might conclude, wasn't the coffee itself. It had to do with uh, what was happening at those clandestine nocturnal gatherings where coffee was being drunk. Of course, the bans on coffee, they were never successful. The genie was out of the bottle, or in this case, the bean was <laughs> out of the pot, and it wouldn't be possible for anyone to ever force it back in. Of course, very soon after that, for the caliphate of at Cairo, the edict was revoked. In 1517, Cairo fell to the Ottomans. By the end of the decade, much of the Middle East and a good part of North Africa was in the hand of the Ottoman Turks. And in the Ottoman world, a phenomenon was brewing. A phenomenon that catapulted coffee into a new dimension and almost overnight would forever transform the landscape of urban culture. Coffee houses. They were established in the Levant before coming to Constantinople. They spread north from Egypt through Syria and by the mid-16th century they had become the most important institutions of social intercourse. The coffee houses in cosmopolitan centers like in Damascus were luxurious, very consciously modeled on the Arabic vision of paradise. Many of them were situated by the rivers and parks and had a relaxing garden-like atmosphere. Customers would sit on benches and divans uh, that lined uh, the walls. Outside there were seats for those who want to drink in the cool of the breeze. So just as in Arabia, the growth of uh, the coffee habit in Turkey stirred uh, a strong reaction at first. In the early 17th century, certain elements within the religious community became concerned about the hypocritical mystics congregated along with the imams who were in danger of becoming coffee house addicts. Again, bans were imposed and uh, declared uh, the coffee being unfit for Muslims to drink. Coffee houses closed, for a time at least, but in their place something more clandestine appeared. It was termed uh, armpit coffee houses, and these were uh, to be found in blind alleys and at the back of certain shops. Bribes, judiciously passed to the chiefs of the police, ensured that the customers continued to enjoy the pleasures of the drink unhindered. Nothing, it seemed, could inhibit the Turkish citizens' quest for this potent stimulant. The ban was lifted, the prohibition ceased, proving once again that it takes more than pious dictates to stop a good idea, especially one that is physically addictive. By 1570, there were over 600 coffee houses in uh, Istanbul. Coffee was rapidly becoming an integral part of the Ottoman culture and has survived as such to this day. By the 17th century, coffee reached Europe, as we've seen, and it was portrayed alternately as a health remedy for headaches, cough of the lungs, and very good to preventing miscarryings, and as a cause of maladies like melancholia, mind degeneration, and impotence. Coffee houses were called sites of vice and sedation. In 1675, King Charles II issued an edict for the suppression. It's an interesting one, isn't it? I mean, not only its popularity, but the whole complex history of it. Bitter, dark and addictive, this isn't just the coffee, it's the whole package. It goes hand in hand with the previous subject we've explored, sugar. But, of course, uh, the history of coffee is a history of exploitation and um, a history of uh, colonialism too, unfortunately. And um, being a commodity that was so useful and so profitable for the Ottomans and yet became so popular to the Europeans, it meant that um, they would find a way to bypass the Yemenis and their beautiful coffee in any way possible. Nearly two centuries after coffee arrived in, in Europe, the Dutch managed to take some coffee plants, to their colony in Java. There, they forced the peasants to go and work in the coffee estates 
for part of the year. The way they did that, the Dutch did that by promising to the local rulers that they will uh, help them keep their power if they help them grow and export their beloved cash crop, coffee. So Java is then becomes one of the biggest producers and exporters of coffee. From 1780, the Caribbean colonies of uh, the Europeans like Martinique, Jamaica, Suriname and Cuba, they all start growing coffee at the time. And here we see the connection between sugar and coffee. In the low-lying areas in the coast, these were good for sugar, which was an intensive crop. So that's where sugar was cultivated uh, and um, harvested and produced uh, by slaves. Higher up the mountains, it was the coffee, which required less dense cultivation. We can see that nearly in all the Caribbean, this production of uh, coffee and sugar was because of African slaves. Europeans created the demand for slaves, this massive slave trade, and thus created the market for cheap goods uh, such as coffee and sugar. Yemeni coffee was not a slave coffee, but Yemeni coffee was also, there was not so much production of Yemeni coffee to cover the demand. In 1735, coffee from Yemen was so much more expensive. It was about three times that of Java. So in 1760, for example, it was equivalent to today's money. It was £12.80 or $12.80 for a pound of uh, Yemeni coffee. In Suriname, which was, uh, I believe, a Dutch colony, that was five pounds and one pence per pound. So we see where they produce the most coffee and the cheapest price. This is where the people suffer the most. The price for the cheap coffee was uh, the suffering of our fellow human beings. And somewhere here, we'll stop for this week. From this point onwards, coffee is entering a new modern era where Mocha, Yemen and the Middle East stop playing such an important and active role in it. Slowly they fade away as we move to the 19th and 20th centuries and away from slavery but to other problems which are still with us today and hopefully we're heading towards a solution for sustainable and future-proof beverage. Thanks for listening. My name is Thomas Dinas and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. If you enjoy this episode, then uh, subscribe wherever you get your podcast from, like and review your podcast and share it with your friends. Share it with three friends via email, WhatsApp, Twitter, Facebook and so on. And uh, spread the word. We have uh, nearly 60 episodes out now and... I'm trying to keep it uh, going and growing and finding more and more interesting subjects of ancient gastronomic culture to bring uh, to wider audiences. I'm also writing about ancient recipes and ingredients that um, are very much um, unknown to our days. So please uh, go and subscribe to my Patreon where you'll find a lot more um, archaeogastronomical content. Thank you. Over and out. <laughs>